Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our weekly virtual reading series. Today we have Jemma Mutegi with us who will be reading um, his book, which we've been publicizing all over Facebook, and it's called Ronnie's Great Idea. So before we get into the book, um, I want to acknowledge our co-sponsors. So that's Alamance Achieves, Future Alamance, Allied Churches of Alamance County, Elena and Jane Books, Burnett Chapel Christian Church, the Kia Foundation, WNCC Western District Social Action Commission, Genesis Child Development Center, and This Woman's Words. Today's literacy resource highlight is the Alamance County Public Library's Children's Virtual New Bookshelf. Um, and we talked about this highlight last week as well, but I really wanted to encourage everyone to go and check it out. So again, you can access it from the Alamance County Public Library System's website, and the link is in all the advertisements for today's reading, um, and it will take you directly to that page. As a reminder, there is a new bookshelf option for adults as well, but this they are all virtual. It tells you what new books are at the library, and it lets you check books out. Um, and I, it might even have a feature that will let you chat with a librarian or give you the phone number for the library in your area if you have any questions. So one last time, that's the Alamance County Public Library's Children's Virtual New Bookshelf. As I said, today we have with us Jomo Mutegi, and Jomo is an educator and the founder of Black Kids Read and the author of nine children's books, including Tale of the Vanishing Buffalo. Through Black Kids Read, Jomo produces science-related children's books featuring positive, uplifting images of Black children and families as protagonists. The books also tackle challenging social and STEM-related topics, making these topics easy for children to understand and for parents to, to explain. Um, and with that all being said, I'm going to turn it over to Jomo. Okay, thank you, Shreya. And give me one moment, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, I wanna thank Soraya and Adrian for inviting me to uh, do this and not just me, but all the other authors they've been featuring during the, during the series. So this story that I'm gonna to read today is called Ronnie's Great Idea. It's, and just to give you a, before I start the story, I wanna give you a sense of why this is an important story. This is actually the story of a real person. His name is Ronald Mallet. Uh, Ronald Mallet is a professor of physics at University of Connecticut. And he does time travel research. So I sometimes share this with my college students and none of them really believe that they'll ever see time travel. And being a bit older than my students, I can remember back to a period of time, say in the 20 years ago, it was nobody would have really thought that you could stream a movie onto a cell phone because the technology wasn't there to enable that. If we go back uh, 30 years ago to the late 80s, or early 90s, nobody would have thought that everybody at one day would be carrying a cell phone that it would be your primary phone. And we could go back 50 years, I don't think people would have thought that something like a cell phone would exist. So when we talk about time travel technology and Dr. Mallet's work, what I see is what this technology might look like in 50 years or so. And it won't be what we see in movies necessarily where people jump into a machine and go back to prehistoric time period. But it's very reasonable that people will be able to send information back and forth um, through, through, time, through time bands. And so I thought this was a compelling story. The fact that this is a black man who is a physicist is compelling. There are very few black scientists, even fewer black physicists. And to have a story of a black physicist who is doing such groundbreaking and pioneering work, I thought was impressive. I'm gonna read the story and then at the end, we'll address some questions. And I'll also take a minute to share some of the other books that we have available. This book is dedicated to Andrick and Alara Moultrie and they are two of our, what we call Black Kids Read All-Stars, the young people who purchase and read Black Kids Read books. This one is also a leveled reader. And the leveled readers that we have books broken out into four levels. Level one readers are for early readers, level two are for developing readers, level three are for independent readers, and this one is for more advanced readers. This one is written on a fourth, fifth grade reading level. Chapter one. 
Ronnie's Grand Plan. Ever since the funeral, Ronnie read all the time. Today, Ronnie was reading quietly in his room. He had been reading all day. He ate no breakfast. He ate no lunch. All he had eaten today was a cooked bologna sandwich. His mother, Dorothy, made him at least that much for dinner. He was reading a book titled Time Machine. He loved it, not because it was a great book, but because while reading it, he came up with his great idea. He would build a time machine of his own that he could travel back in time and so that he could travel back in time and save his father's life. As Ronnie thought about his great idea, he remembered back to when he was very young. He remembered how his father, Boyd, would come home after work working all day. Although Boyd would be tired, he always made time for the entire family, Dorothy, Ronnie, Ronnie's younger brothers, Keith and Jason, and especially Ronnie's baby sister, Eve. After eating dinner together, Dorothy would clean up while the younger children would play. Boyd would pull Ronnie aside and use an old television to teach Ronnie something new about electronics. When the children went to bed, Boyd would spend time with Dorothy. Ronald sometimes heard them whispering on the couch. Dorothy always spoke kindly and said nice things about her husband. Ronnie really missed his father. One Saturday morning after he finished reading the time machine, Ronnie decided that he was ready to build a time machine of his very own. He read portions of the book that described the time machine. He looked at pictures in the book that showed the time machine. Ronnie then made a list of things he would need. String, large cardboard boxes, glue, tape, the blade of a house fan, a steering wheel, and of course, an old clock. Ronnie spent the entire day reading the book, examining the pictures, drawing diagrams and building the machine, reading, examining, drawing and building, reading, examining, drawing and building. He didn't watch TV. He didn't go out to play. He didn't eat. He only stopped when it was time to sleep. When Sunday morning, then Sunday morning, he woke, washed and went back to work. Finally, just before dinner on Sunday evening, he finished. He gathered his mother, brothers and sister and showed them his creation. He did not tell them his great idea. That would be a surprise, but they were all very excited by his creation. His mother, Dorothy, beamed with pride and she made an especially good dinner. Dinner was filled with chatter about Ronnie's creation and near the end, Dorothy surprised everyone with a peach cobbler and ice cream dessert. It was everyone's favorite. The next day, Ronnie woke full of hope and excitement. At school, he invited his, some of his friends to come see a special surprise. At home that day, before Dorothy returned from work, Ronnie unveiled his time machine for his friends. What is it? One of them asked. It's a time machine, Ronnie responded proudly. I built it. Now I'm going to go back in time and save my father. With that, Ronnie sat in the front of his machine. He reached forward to adjust the clock. He reached back to flip the switch on the fan blade but nothing happened. The clock simply flashed at Ronnie and the fan blew dust throughout the room. As Ronnie sat there puzzled, the boys began to snicker. When he turned the fan speed up to a higher setting, they began to laugh aloud. Ronnie tapped the clock and they began to laugh uncontrollably. Ronnie fumed with anger. He jumped off of his machine and sent the boys out of his house. Ronnie sulked through the entire dinner that evening. Neither Dorothy, nor Jason, nor Keith, nor Eve said anything. Just as Ronnie was getting up to leave the table, Dorothy rubbed his back and whispered to him, it's still a great idea. Keep at it. You'll make it work one day. Before going to bed that night, Keith came to Ronnie's room with a painting of Ronnie's time machine. Standing next to it were Ronnie and Boyd. They had their hands raised and they were wearing big smiles. Ronnie smiled at his little brother and gave him a hug. When Ronnie went to bed, he realized that he could only trust his great idea to people who are special to him. For all others, it must be a great secret. That night as Ronnie lay in bed, he remembered the many things his father taught him. 
Boyd taught Ronnie about electrons, which he called tiny workers. He explained to Ronnie that these tiny workers gave televisions their power. They also powered other things like clocks, toasters, and light bulbs. His father believed that these tiny workers would be the power source of the future. Ronnie remembered his father telling him that one day, Ronnie would need to learn more about electricity and electronics. As Ronnie slept that night, he was no longer angry. He slept with the calm that comes from the gentle touch of a loving mother, the caring gesture of a loving brother, and the wise instruction of a loving father. The next morning before going to school, Ronnie told his mother that he needed to learn more about electricity to make his time machine work. Mom, how can I learn about electricity? I suppose the best place to start is at the library, she replied. That evening, Dorothy took Ronnie and the whole gang to the library. Everyone brought back one or two books. That struck, that struck them as interesting, except for Ronnie. Ronnie had a grocer's bag full of books on electricity. Over the next few weeks, Ronnie would pore over these books, learning everything he could about electricity. When he had gone through these, he would return to the library to get another load and start again. Chapter two, the family's big move. Even in his absence, Boyd Mallet provided his family with so much. Ronnie remembered his father's wisdom and advice. Keith and Jason were always reminded of his firm and loving guidance. Eve admired his strength. Dorothy, even now, felt his protection and the security he provided. What he was not able to provide in his absence was the daily sustenance that the family needed. This was a difficult time for, the, for Dorothy as she struggled to provide good clothes and food in her husband's absence. Seeing this, Dorothy's father sent for the family to move to Pennsylvania, where he could help them through this difficult time. When he heard the news, Ronnie was both excited and nervous. He was excited because he loved spending time with his grandpa and grandma. He was nervous because he was not sure that he could take his books with him. Before he was able to ask, Dorothy smiled at him and said, of course, there'll be plenty of room for your library. Then turning to Keith, she added, in your art studio. Everyone really loved being in Pennsylvania. Grandma always gave great hugs and grandpa and hugs and kisses. Grandpa always told great stories and absolutely everyone loved the great food. It seemed, however, that not everyone loved the mallets. One day, Ronnie was walking with his mother to the grocery store. On their way back, there was a group of boys about Ronnie's age who looked like trouble. As Ronnie and his mother passed the boys, Dorothy smiled politely and said, good afternoon, boys. A few moments later, Ronnie heard one of the boys call out a racial slur. Ronnie felt his heart race. He stopped cold in his tracks and spun around and headed straight towards a group of boys. He wasn't sure which boy made the comment, but he walked up to the boy who seemed to be in charge. Without a word, Ronnie pulled back his fist and hit him in the eye. As the boy fell, Ronnie leaped on him and continued hitting him until the boy stopped struggling. All of the other boys and Dorothy simply watched. They were stunned and didn't know what to do. Ronnie got up and walked slowly back towards his mother. He had fought and messed up his clothes. He just knew that he was going to be punished. As they walked back toward the house, neither Ronnie nor Dorothy said anything for a very long time. Ronnie never looked away from his feet. After some time, he looked at his mother and said softly, I'm sorry. Dorothy smiled and rubbed his, ba rubbed his back gently. Ronnie, don't be sorry. Self-respect is the foundation of justice. Your father taught me that. Dorothy never said it directly, but Ronnie knew that she was proud of him. He also knew that his father would have been proud. The two never spoke of the event again, but Ronnie never forgot what his mother had said. Self-respect is the foundation of justice. Chapter three, the date that never was. As Ronald grew older, he was very shy. Throughout high school, he enjoyed reading and studying, especially mathematics and physics. 
and Ronald never lost sight of his goal of building the time machine. Sometimes on Saturdays, Ronald would spend the entire day with his grandpa building and fixing things around the house. During these times, his grandfather would caution him not to isolate himself. Friendship is very important in life, he would say. As Ronald thought long and hard about what his grandfather said, he remembered back to when he was very young. He remembered then, he remembered that when all the kids were put to bed, he would sneak out and watch his parents from around the corner. He remembered his father Boyd would put on a record, put a record on the old record player, and he would slowly dance with his mother for what seemed like hours. He remembered how excited his mother would be. He was all, she was all smiles and giggles, dancing on that living room floor. Ronald realized that he wanted a wife and children one day. He wanted to provide them all the joy that his own father had provided. There was a young lady in his physics class that caught his eye. Her name was Virginia. Virginia was the most beautiful girl that he had known. She reminded him of Dorothy Dandridge. Sometimes when Ronald would come to class, Virginia would save a seat, would save a seat next to hers. In return, Ronald would always offer to carry Virginia's books to her next class. Virginia was very happy and excited about her growing friendship with Ronald. She hoped that he would ask her to the prom. One day, a very jealous girl that ate lunch with Virginia fibbed. She told Virginia that Ronald had asked someone else to the prom. After that, Virginia was very embarrassed. She never again saved seats for Ronald in class. Ronald was heartbroken. He couldn't figure out what he had done to upset Virginia. He wanted to ask her to the prom, but he thought she no longer liked him. Ronald finished the rest of his time in high school without ever going on a date or even showing interest in another girl. Chapter four, Ronald's great disappointment. After high school, many of the white kids went to college. College was very expensive. Even though many of the black students wanted to go to college, it was not affordable. So the black students often went right to work. Ronald thought long and hard about going to college so that he could learn more physics and mathematics. He knew that going to college would be the best way to learn what he needed in order to build his time machine. An older friend of the family told Ronald that if he went to the military for four years, then he could pay for college with the money he earned. So Ronald signed up for the United States Air Force. Ronald even, even often thought about Virginia. It made him very sad that they were never able to get to know one another better. Being in the military gave Ronald a chance to try to get over the sadness he felt. He thought that he would really work hard to make friends with the other airmen and to possibly even meet a nice lady. One day, Ronald and some of the other airmen had time away from the base. They decided to go into the local town, have dinner and watch a movie. As they went into the restaurant, a group of whites from the town surrounded Ronnie. They began cursing at him and yelling insults. A fat, greasy man wearing a soiled apron came out from the kitchen and told Ronald to leave, saying, we don't serve your kind here, boy. Ronald looked at his friends, hoping for some support. Most of them looked away without saying anything. Finally, one of the soldiers looked at Ronnie and said, just head back to the base, Ron. We'll be back soon. Ronald was livid. He had to walk back eight miles to the base because the airman who drove a car stayed at the restaurant. He could not believe that none of the others would speak or act in his defense. He could not believe that they would stay and eat in that restaurant after he had been treated so badly. On this long walk back to the base, Ronald had a lot of time to think. In that time, he realized that those soldiers were not really his friends. Friends do not treat you badly. He also realized that he had started getting away from his goal of building a time machine. You can't build a time machine eating in a greasy restaurant with uncivilized people, he thought. At that, Ronald declined, excuse me, Ronald decided that he would focus even more on his time machine. At his first opportunity, Ronald did what he had been doing for years. 
He went to the nearest library and he brought as many books as he could carry in one trip. Now he was reading books that were very complicated to understand. In fact, there were some that he did not understand. He simply read them anyway. He noticed symbols in mathematics books that he had never seen before. He wondered, how can I teach myself the meaning of these symbols? Mathematics is like a different language. He noticed words in physics books that he had, not, that he had never heard before. He wondered, how can I teach myself the meaning of these words? Physics is like a different language. Even though Ronald thought that he couldn't understand some of the books, his effort paid off. He learned more than he thought. He began to see the same words and symbols over and over again. He began to have an idea of what they meant. For four years, Ronald immersed himself in his books. He never thought about trying to be friends with the other soldiers. His only dream was to build a time machine and have Virginia by his side when he did it. Chapter five, Dr. Mallet's great achievement. While in the Air Force, Ronald saved up enough money to pay for college. When he went to college, there were many black people all over the world fighting for better treatment. Ronald thought about the way he and his mother were insulted by the little boy in Altoona. He thought about the way he was mistreated in the military. He liked these black people because they would make life better for all black people. One day, Ronald was approached by two men from the FBI. These men asked Ronnie to spy on the black college students who were fighting for better treatment. Ronald stood up to the FBI. He refused to help. He told them that he would never work to hurt other black people. Ronald finally graduated from college. Everyone was proud of him. His mother, Dorothy, his brothers, Keith and Jason, and even his sister, Eve. They were so proud of him that they began calling him Dr. Mallet. After graduating from college, Dr. Mallet went to work for a company that made lasers. He made a lot of money with, with this job and he also learned a lot about lasers. He liked the company and he liked making a lot of money, but he was still very sad. He was sad because he, he always thought of Virginia and he wished that she were able to be with him. He was also sad because he really wanted to build a time machine. Dr. Mallet decided to take matters into his own hands. He left the laser company and took a job working at the University of Connecticut. At the university, he made less money. His main job was to teach classes and to do research. Dr. Mallet could do any type of research that he wanted to do, so he chose to, research, to do research on time travel. After many years of research, Dr. Mallet finally came up with an idea for a time travel machine, but he did not tell anyone. Before sharing his idea, he was going to make sure that it was perfect. This, this way, no one would laugh at his idea. Dr. Mallet's idea was to build a time travel machine. Dr. Mallet's idea was to build a time travel machine that used lasers to bend space and time. He worked for hours, days, weeks, and months, making sure that his time travel machine would work. Finally, when he was sure it would work, he wrote a paper about his idea. He also got a patent on a blueprint for his time machine. This way, no one would steal his idea. Dr. Mallet now leads a team of scientists who are using his blueprint as a guide to building a real working model of his time travel machine. The young man who once dreamed of building a time, time machine to save his father's life is now a grown man. Dr. Mallet is still living today. He is still working as a professor at the University of Connecticut. We don't know what the future holds. We don't know whether Dr. Mallet will travel back in time to save his father. We don't know if he will find Virginia or a woman like her and finally have the family that he's always wanted. What we do know is that Dr. Ronald Lawrence Mallet has done more for time travel research than any other physicist living. And we are certain that his father, Boyd Mallet, would be extremely proud of him. So at the end of this book, there are discussion topics. And these are to, to encourage uh, parents that these are tools that parents can, and teachers can use to encourage students to think more reflectively on the book. 
one thing I stress is that it's not important for parents and teachers to some degree to have answers to these questions. What we really want to do is we want students to become and our children to become curious about the text they read and to come up with their own answers. I'm just going to read a couple so that you get a sense of what these are like. So the first question asks, how and when did Ronald become interested in time travel? So that's a question that is stated, the answer to it is stated pretty explicitly in the text. But then there are other questions. Um, we'll look at number, number eight. What character traits did Dr. Mallet have that enabled him to be successful? So that's not stated explicitly and that gives children a chance to think through, okay, what did I see in this text that stands out? And so I encourage parents not to uh, necessarily correct children, just join them in discussion around the text. Then in addition to discussion topics, we have um, vocabulary words. So you'll notice that in reading it, for an adult, it might seem that there's too much repetition. So you'll notice some terms being repeated over and over again or certain words being repeated over. But for beginning readers, that's important because it's the practice and the repetition that helps them to strengthen their reading. And so we also have words that we expect children of, of this age would not know. This gives a chance for us to give, to give the students opportunity to learn those, those new vocabulary. So these are vocabulary building books as well. And I won't go through this, but a level four reader tends to have more vocabulary words than the earlier level readers. And we also suggest games that parents can play with children to help them increase the vocabulary. And we usually give a description of some of the games in this portion of the text. So all of the black kids read books, all of the level readers and all of, of the picture books have this feature, the um, discussion topics and the growing your vocabulary. That's my bio. And again, there's a level reader um, description of the level readers. So Sherea mentioned in the beginning that I've, I've written nine books so far. We have another book that is planned to be released in October. I'm very excited about this next one. Uh, it's, it was a fun one to write, but a few things I want to underscore. This, this book here told the story of a Black scientist. Um, many of the other books take on topics that we don't see presented in standard school-based science instruction. I mean, really, even a book like this one, we don't see many Black scientists in our instruction, but Black scientists and Blacks who weren't officially scientists have done tremendous work in advancing science knowledge. And the white scientists who get credit for the work um, often built on the work of those Blacks. We noted the story of, of um, Thomas Edison and Lewis Latimer's role, they want to make like he had a small role, but what good is a light bulb if it don't stay lit? Okay, <laughs> so Thomas Edison gave us a glass with a spark in it, and Thomas Edison made it, I mean, excuse me, Latimer actually made it a viable uh, a development. And so this, this story is one that's important that's not often covered, but then we also take on topics. So the new book that's coming out looks at pet ownership and the ethics of pet ownership and different models of pet ownership. And so that's a topic that's taken for granted that there is one right way to interact with your dog, you know, keep him in the house with you uh, so that when you go into work, he'd be in your living room all day, <laughs> you know, <laughs> he watch TV with you. That's really how dogs want to live. Well, I don't know, maybe, maybe not. There are other models. And so that book kind of takes on that topic. We have a series of books that look at food deserts and in many urban settings, we don't have good access to, um, to fresh produce, but most of us have some kind of a yard, even if we don't have a yard, even in an apartment, you can grow things in pots. And so we do have the ability to have more agency and ensure better food for ourselves. So that series, that's Rebecca's Healing Garden, that takes on that idea of, of food deserts. We have another one that takes on the, the um, issue of, of raising our own, our own meat so many of us have questions about what's really in the stuff that's given to us to eat, um, but we have the ability to, to control to a large degree the food that we eat. So that series takes on, uh, Kayla's First Chicks, Chickens takes on that, that topic. So I encourage you to visit our website, uh, blackkidsread.net. All of our books are available on Amazon. However, 
I encourage you if you want to make a purchase to purchase them from our website. The reason is if you purchase from Amazon, we don't get to know you. Uh, there's no way that we have to reach you. Um, we don't really even know who purchases if it goes to Amazon. If you purchase from the website, then we have the ability to, um, to reach out to you and to reach our customers directly. And so I like to be able to reach our customers directly. When Amazon makes a change as an independent uh, publisher, we don't really have that ability to, to maintain that contact. So not only with me, but I encourage you with, with any of the independent publishers that you buy from, it's really important for us that we be able to reach our customers. So I'm going to stop there and Sharia see if you or Adrian have any questions before we end. Okay, I will get you to stop sharing your screen so I can put us oh, back in yes. gallery view. I really do love that that graphic though, and and I really I really want that on a shirt. Adrian suggested that earlier, and I think that would be amazing. We are working on it. We'll work. On Wonderful. It. Keep me posted so that I can get one. Um, I'm really glad that you talked about Rebecca's Healing Garden. Let me start with that because I um, had that book in my cart and I wondered what it was about. Um, and I kind of read the summary a little bit, and I, I'm really glad that you went into it being about food deserts. Um, Adrian and I are in the same county, so we are in Alamance County, North Carolina. And we do have some food deserts in our area, um, just because the, the county is very, very vast and is uh, kind of rural. And so the, the closer you get to the outskirts of the county, the less grocery stores and things of that nature that you have. And of course, you don't have as many um, people that farm or that are even really interested in agriculture like you used to in this county. So we have these large spaces of land, but we don't necessarily have people growing food there. Right. And you have a lot of people that it's easier for them to access like maybe a fast food restaurant than a, a grocery store. Um, and so they've actually uh, started in our county doing a lot of farmers markets. And I feel like that's really helping. Yes. Um, and so I'm really glad that you talked about Rebecca's Healing Garden because that one, that was on my list. I'm, I'm coming for that one. Um, so I wanted to tell you that just a few things that I loved about the book. So Ronnie's use of libraries was so amazing to me. And I think that, you know, in today's time, we do, we would have just been like, oh, just Google it. <laughs> like, <laughs> we stopped utilizing libraries. And so I'm really glad that you brought up his use of libraries and how he read for context. So he kept reading until he understood the words instead of just giving up. Um, and I think it's important to, to point out to our readers who may not know life without Google and the internet that, you know, there used to be a time when you had to go to the books. Yes. Um, I remember having to use the encyclopedia and you couldn't just, you had to go to the library or have the encyclopedia in your house. There was no internet to, to find the answers. Um, so I'm really, uh, I really enjoy his use of the library. Um, shocked by the FBI asking him to be a spy. Not, not genuinely shocked, but surprised that that occurred. Um, because it just seems like, you know, as somebody who had been in the Air Force and gone on about his business and was in college, like, why would you assume that you could just use him as a spy? That's crazy. Sri, if I can just interject. Yeah. So I didn't mention that this is a historical fiction, so, or a biographical fiction, excuse me. So most of the main ideas and main stories are true. I just fictionalized it to condense it into a children's story. Mm -hmm. So that is a true event that really happened. And it's not uncommon. I have a friend who works for the um, Department of the Navy who explained to me that if you have a PhD, you, are on, you automatically get on the FBI's list. And for sure, I know that anyone with a PhD in physics is on a government list. And so I don't think that this would be an uncommon task because they have a skill set that allows them to make weapons and that sort of thing. But you know, to be to know that you're just trying to go about doing your work and that you're under the thumb of the government or under the watchful eye of the government is, is a lot. And it's something for children who want to aspire to those careers to be aware of that possibility that you're going to be likely be watched, you know. And it's amazing that you bring that up. I don't know why I never would have thought of that, Jomo, but that actually, I understand I mean, I wouldn't watch them, but I understand why the thought process would be, you know, th this Black person with this information and this knowledge, you know, we pay attention to them. So I'm very glad that you included that in the book. Um, Self-respect is the foundation of justice. Mm -hmm. That is an amazing line. And I just need you to, I just needed to say it again for the people watching on Facebook, because Sometimes I feel like when we have these conversations about justice, we leave out the whole idea of self-respect altogether. 
and what that looks like in today's society. And justice takes on many forms and how we approach justice takes on many forms, but even as a child. Now, I'm not saying you have to beat them up if they call you a racial slur, that's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is having self-respect, knowing who you are is very, very important, regardless of what people may say to or about you. Right. And so I really, really like that line. And then the last thing that I'm gonna say, and then I'm, I'm gonna let Adrian ask her questions because I just needed to get these out, is that the realizations about his friends and his goals Mm -hmm. and where he kind of got off course and he kind of took a detour and needed to come back to what was important. I really, really liked how you approached that. And I feel like there was a, an important lesson in there for both our adult and our youth viewers because we all get off track sometimes, but getting back on track is very important. And sometimes it takes something like somebody kicking you out of a restaurant for you to really have the time to think about what you're prioritizing and where you should be putting yourself um, to get ahead and to accomplish your goal. So I, I really just, I really enjoyed that book. I'm glad that you read the whole book because I, I really enjoyed it. Before right. on Facebook Live, y'all, we were having a conversation about did we want to do excerpts or did we want to do the whole book? And I'm just, I'm really glad that you read the whole book. I think the book is phenomenal. So thank you for that. Thank you. Adrian, I know you got questions, child. Come on. I do, but you know, I got to start with compliments first. Um, so yeah, I loved everything about this book. I love that um, it presents community within family and support, um, being very realistic about our dreams um, and the, how we have to hold on to our dreams, how things can come in and kind of deter us from our dreams, but we have to stay the course. Um, I absolutely adored that. Um, I think so often, you know, we as adults, you know, tell kids, yeah, you can, whatever you want to be, you can be that, right? But we don't give them that realistic factor that sometimes things come in and put us off track, but it's up to us to stick to it. We have to have that stick to itiveness, right? To continue to pursue. And like, you know, Sharia mentioned, um, you know, sometimes we have to make, you know, relationship changes with our friends. Um, and, you know, I also, I, I really love the part where, um, you know, he left or Ronnie left that high paying job. So it also shows that money is not the only important factor, right? It's nice to make a lot of money, sure, but it's better and more fulfilling to be happy and to go towards your dreams. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes that does come with a pay cut, but are you fulfilled really is the question at the end of the day, um, you know, you have to decide whether or not you're gonna compromise that. Um, self-respect is the foundation of justice. Um, so I'm gonna say this, <clears throat> I'm a huge fan of t-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> so let Another me- Another t-shirt. <laughs> I'm, I'm the queen of homework. So, you know, I would I would love to see the Black Kids Read logo on the front and then on the back, you know, make that like the a, a slogan for the back of the shirt. That way, you know, you can always remember, okay, well, I, I can read and learn anything, right? Um, and then just remembering that phrase that self-respect is the foundation of justice. You have to, like Sharia said, if you don't have respect for yourself, no one else will. If you compromise yourself in so many other things, how are you supposed to, um, you know, expect people to respect your boundaries because you yourself don't respect them? Um, you know, I love the fact that you highlighted, highlighted um, the fact that, you know, Ronnie went through some, some instances where race, you know, his race played a factor. Um, that's still relevant, regardless of what people say, racism is alive and well, it has never died, it's always been here. Um, and I appreciate the fact that you addressed it. Um, in my personal opinion, I felt like if we actually talked about it more then you know, and ways to combat that and, you know, what that looks like and how we need to try our best to, to react from all perspectives of race, um, I think we could be better as a nation, but I'm going to shut up on that because um, I could talk all day about that. Um, yeah, I just loved every everything about this book. I love how you're using your children's books to, you know, like, if it's your form of activism, right, um, with the group that, um, you know, Sharia and I are in, you know, and just privately, too, we've talked about a lot of how our current county has um, structured things and businesses are going more towards the outskirts, but it's killing the parts of our, our county that actually need the grocery stores more. 
um, and not just on the outskirts in the country, but, um, you know, some of it is just kind of like centralized to, you know, those, um, the demographics who are more potentially lower income, you know, the, and those are the ones that need it the most. Um, and teaching us how to change our perspectives on, you know, what we can do for fresh black, I could go on. Um, I'm a huge fan and I'll be quiet. I have no questions. <laughs> I just lots and lots of compliments. Um, let me stop. One question. Okay. So what, what made you... <laughs> I've had a lot of coffee, y'all. Um, <laughs> all right, one question. So what made you want to write these style of books? Because it takes an incredible amount of courage to be able to even say, okay, well, this is what I'm going to do. Yeah, so in, in, my, in my work, my research work, I, I develop um, science curriculum that really are aimed at helping African-American learners to, to be more liberatory. So, so much in science, in science education, we're focused on uh, the numbers. Do we have equal representation? And Amos Wilson said, we wanna teach black children to read. We say teach them to read, but we never address teach them to read for what? Mm -hmm. Why teach them to read to do the same thing that whites are doing to us? So, for me, that means that not only do we want our children to be able to read, but we also want them to be able to read in a, for a purpose that's going to be liberatory for our community. And since I'm in science education, I'm asking myself, how can I, in this role, move us towards that? And we have developed curriculum and made it available to uh, future teachers, to practicing teachers. But I was having difficulty helping people to see that science is not a cultural. We, we look at science and math as though they're not part of a culture or a social system that they're somehow detached. And then it occurred to me, I was reading a book called um, Making Things Stick. It's by two brothers. One is an, an educator and one is in business. And they say in marketing and in education, one way that we can make ideas stick is through a story. And so that really resonated with me. And I, the, the examples they gave hit, hit home. And so I thought, okay, so maybe a story is a good vehicle for helping people to see where um, uh, science, the science that we cover in schools is not necessarily race neutral, where that does come into play. And it also gives a space to show for, for black students and families, there are some things that are fully within our control. When we look at our problems, we sometimes act as though we don't have any agency. Like we need white people to come fix this for us. We really don't. We can fix our problems. And the story helps us to see how we can fix our problems. And so, and as you all have mentioned, Dr. Mallet's story is, is rife with examples of him being confronted with problems. And he and his family designed ways to work around those problems so that he could have a fruitful life. And, and the family, despite the, tra the, the trauma they went through early on, his brother is a highly regarded artist. I had one of his brothers, Prince, before I knew, I didn't even know who he was, but it's, um, I think it's four generations. And my father gave it to me as a gift. And only in doing this book that I realized, oh, I know this guy, I know his work. <laughs> oh, so he, he's highly regarded artist. And the others in his family are, are very productive people, so. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely adore it. Great job, job well done. Um, Thanks, Adrian. Again, I'm the queen of homework. So, I mean, like, maybe reach out to um, like the Boys and Girls Club. I know right now um, from what I've, I'm understanding about my local Boys and Girls Club, they're um, kind of focusing on STEM and what that may look like. Um, so that would be, um, you know, a way that you can kind of pivot and get in there because I think you're 100% spot on. There, you know, the, the message that you have, it, it spans beyond race, number one. Um, I think more people need to, to learn and kind of get back to our roots of, you know, not being so dependent on the market for things that, you know, we can freely and easily grow um, and produce and just be. Um, and at this point, I will shut up. Okay. <laughs> we, we appreciate your spirit and energy, Adrian. <laughs> I, she, she ain't never got to shut up. She just chooses to. She, she's a <laughs> um, so when she said Boys and Girls Club, it also made me think that like a lot of organizations like the National Council of Negro Women are doing like STEM type work for black and brown communities. And so you might want to reach out to see if there's one in your area, um, a okay. section there. 
Um, I think the website for, for the, the organization is ncnw.org. Um, and it can tell you where the different locations are for the different sections. And I mean, I think that that what you're offering is amazing. I know that our local section here is actually trying to do like a STEM based um, young entrepreneurs contest that will be virtual. And so I think that that what you're talking about with regards to agency and liberation through reading are very, very important. Um, I'm a blogger. So so Adrian is, a, is the, the author of the group. I'm, I'm a blogger and my hashtag is always writing is my activism. And I say that because just like your views on, on reading, I feel like so often we're, we're talking to kids about writing and writing poetry and writing short stories or writing whatever just as assignments. And we're not looking at the liberation that can be found through the use of our words and reading and writing go hand in hand for me. So I feel like I learned about activism through reading about it and then I put it into practice through writing about it. And so I feel that same thing with regards to the types of topics you're writing about, even down to books about pets. Because to be honest, I just feel like there are so many things that you talked about that you have written books about that it has never dawned on me that I've never read a book about. And you you are feeling that that voice. So I think that that's, that's great. Um, and I will say that my question for you is, what led you to start Black Kids Read? Well, you know, I started the books and I was looking for, I don't remember the exact, what exactly happened, but I know my wife and I were talking about ways of packaging and presenting to try to help spread the word. And she may have suggested that, um, you know, it may have been me seeing other similar, um, I don't know what you want to call them, hashtags, monikers. Um, my wife was in Black Girls Run. And, and there's so many along those lines, you know, black something, something. <laughs> so I thought it was catchy. I looked and no one had, was really using it. And so I just started using it and um, then over time just formalized it. But I like it because it's pithy and it, it gets right to the point. You see it and there's no question about what it's about, about black. Well, and you know, it's also like an affirmative statement, like how you have people say things like Black Lives Matter and people say it's just a statement, like it's just an affirmative statement. I think that Black Kids Read communicates to Black children that they can read and that reading is important. And it communicates to non-Black people that Black kids do in fact read, right? And so I think that makes it, that's what makes it so great is because you read it and I read it and was like, oh, that's amazing. And I wasn't thinking of a t-shirt, but then Adrian said t-shirt and now <laughs> buy a t-shirt. So. Yeah. If the t-shirts are available, let me know. <laughs> Look, y'all been on with these t-shirts. You will, you, I will have a t-shirt within a month, at least. Okay. Look, I'm going to hold you to it, Jumbo, now. I'm coming back. Hold me to it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, again, I just want to thank you so much for being here. I want to thank Demetrius for her help this morning. We had a little audio snafu, and she she yeah. me out. Um, thank you to Adrian as well. This has been a delightful conversation, Jemma. I really appreciate you, and I'm really glad that you read to us today. Your work is, is magnificent, and it's it's very much so needed. So I'm, I'm glad to have you here. Um, so your website is blackkidsread.net. Is there anywhere else on uh, social media that people can find you? Yes. So we have um, a Facebook uh, page also. Um, if you search for Black Kids Reader, it'll come up. I think it's actually under my name. That's a shame. I don't remember. Uh, I think it's Jomo, under Jomo Mategi on Facebook. But if you search for Black Kids Reader, it'll bring you back to the page. I also have my, my research group has a website. So if you're interested in how the work connects, you can go to my, my research group page. So that is www.es2rp. E S two R P dot um, org. So um, E E S two. It's E S squared Re Learning Lab. So E S two is E S squared Research Program. Is how they. That's where it comes from. And for for parents who just want a, a sense of the research behind this work. So we've done projects with high school students, teaching them to be science writers. And we wrote a chapter on that process and how we need to re-envision science curriculum to, to enable those type of interactions. We do studies on uh, basically on how the, the teaching and learning of science for people of African descent. The, the model, the theoretical model that undergirds all these books 
was a paper we wrote in 2011 and we've written other papers on the model and other subject areas since then in mathematics. We've given examples of how it looks at instruction. Um, on that website, we also have what we call family activities. So I'm really big on the fact that as parents, we can do a lot with our children to help them become better at math and science. But see, we're afraid that we don't know enough math and science. We don't need to know no math and science to help our kids. All we have to do is help our kids be curious and help, help them raise questions. And so the family activities are saying, look, you can make jam with your children. And just as you're making jam, ask them some questions that stimulate their thinking. They will take that experience and those questions into the classroom with them. They'll be two, three steps ahead of their peers because they have a concrete experience to relate new information to. And they've already started thinking about relevant science questions. And so we have a series of family, family activities and making jam is one of the activities. Um, you can, if you like watching movies, there's good movies you can watch, but watch them with a critical eye and raise those questions with your, with your children. So I'm just giving you the research site if you think you may be interested in, in stepping beyond the books or seeing how the books relate to the research. Thank you for that. Um, and so that was es2rp.org if anybody yes. wants to check it out. And since you mentioned the activities, I will also say that I appreciate the discussion topics and the vocabulary in Ronnie's um, great idea. Um, and I think that the reason that I appreciate it so much is that sometimes we read a book and then we leave it alone. Right. And allows you to keep engaging with it. And I think that, that that's important. Um, and those vocabulary words, good good call on that because it didn't even occur to me that children might not know those words. So that's, that's a great call. I'm, I'm glad you did that. Um, so again, that's blackkidsread.net and es2rp.org. I know that Adrian is posting links in the comment section on Facebook. I have also put Jomo's name in the comments on Facebook so that he is able to see your comments and able to answer any questions that you all might have. Um, for those of you who are watching who are teachers and or who provide like after school services, I encourage you all to reach out to Jomo because I think he would be wonderful for the, the children that you all work with. Um, and with that being said, I will let you all know that we have next week coming to us Dr. Tabitha Spurlock. She will be reading her best selling book, A Promise is a Promise. And so we will be back on Saturday at 1130 on Facebook Live and on Zoom. The flyer and the social media information will go up shortly so that you all can purchase the book. Um, and again, I encourage you to buy Ronnie's Great Idea to buy Rebecca's Healing Garden, to buy anything else that you find on Black Kids Net. And in about a month, you can buy a t-shirt there and it's gonna be amazing. So thank you so much, Jomo. It's a pleasure to have you here. And I look forward to seeing what you're doing with Black Kids Read. Thank you all. Bye y'all.